everyone, and uh, welcome to Building a Better World with Words, a celebration of Irish women's writing in partnership with Five Leaves Bookshop and Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. My name is Sandeep Mahal and I work at Nottingham UNESCO City of Literature. Nottingham and Dublin are part of an international network of UNESCO cities of literature and we spend a lot of time sharing knowledge and practice and stealing the best ideas from each other but we also form special collaborations to connect readers to writers and inspire all audiences from all over the world. Um, Dublin City of Literature was awarded its UNESCO designation in 2010. It's famously home to Wild Swift, Joyce Beckett and Shaw, but their UNESCO designation is about so much more than literary giants of the past. Dublin's vision as a city of literature is to be recognised internationally as a place where reading, writing, and storytelling or experiences that are embedded in the cultural and social fabric of the city and over the last two years they've been working hard to redress the gender imbalance that has long existed in the literary world by celebrating Irish women writers and we are continuing that celebration with four inspiring women tonight. Before I introduce our first host, I just want to direct you all to the chat room. Um, so please let us know who you are and where you are listening in from. And if you have a question for any of our guests, post your question in the Q&A room that you can see along the bottom of your screen. And we'll pick up those questions during the Q&A session. We're very excited to be partnering with Five Leaves Bookshop. Uh, Pippa uh, can answer any book related questions in the chat room and do make the most of their three for two offer on all books by our guest authors. So now I'm delighted to introduce Five Leaves bookseller and lecturer in English and Irish, Irish literature at Loughborough University, Deirdre O'Byrne, to introduce our first guest and to explain how this event is going to work. Over to you, Deirdre. Sandy. I'm really pleased to be asked to interview Emily Pine. We invited Emily over last year. It didn't work out. So I was so thrilled to hear she had accepted the invitation this time. I'm going to talk to Emily for about 20 minutes and then I will hand over to Alison Lyons, who is the director of UNESCO City of Literature in Dublin. And um, Alison will be in conversation with Christine Dwyer Hickey, our second author, for about 20 minutes. And then there'll be a Q&A when we'll deal with the questions you've put in your chat facility. Um, it's unlikely that all the questions will be answered, so there'll be a selection process. Um, right, get cracking. Welcome, Emily. Emily Pine, it's fair to say you burst on the scene in 2018 with this collection of essays, which is a memoir, um, six essays about your own life. And it won the Butler Literary Award, the Sunday Independent Newcomer of the Year Award. It was chosen by Irish Book Awards as their book of the year, and it became a bestseller. Were you surprised by the reaction to the book, Emily? I was surprised. Um... Hi, Deirdre, it's lovely to be here. Um, I, and, and this, like doing events like this has been the kind of unexpected outcome of sitting down at my desk and starting to write the very first essay, which is about my dad and it, things that had happened between me and my dad over the course of our lives. And when I started writing, it was really for me. I mean, that's part of the pun of the title notes to self is that I felt like it was a book I was writing for myself. And I never imagined anybody ever reading it. And it was only after I had finished writing about my father that I sent the first, that first, well, what I now think of as the first essay, but then was the only thing I had written, um, to a publisher, to the Irish publisher Tramp Press. And they were the ones who said, we think there's more here. We'd like you to write more. Would you be happy to do that? And I did. And even though they were, they were huge believers in the book and I kept thinking, oh no, they've made a terrible mistake. Um, in that way that I think we all question ourselves so much. And so I was writing away and I had their total support, but I, I, I just couldn't have imagined it. And it was funny because then in the first week it sold like 400 copies and I thought, well, that's it. That's everybody, right? The, there's, no, there's no other people who could possibly buy this book. And then it just went from there. And what I think, 
And I, I wasn't so much surprised by the reason for why it became a bestseller, because people kept coming up to me, men as well as women, but particularly women, saying, this is my life as well. And that was it. That was, that was extraordinary. The way in which through writing about experiences I thought only I had had, all those things that we stay really quiet about because we're embarrassed or ashamed or afraid in some way, through writing about those things and kind of maybe breaking some of the silences we have around them, I realized that everybody else has these, we have these things in common, you know, even if it's the silence that we have in common. So that it, it just it just became this much larger phenomenon and it was also in ireland and you'll know this yourself it was also in ireland the past couple of years have seen a lot of social change and so the year that the book came out in 2018 was also the year that ireland voted to legalize abortion for the first time and so those kind of big changes feel like audiences are ready and different ready for different voices and for different kinds of stories that maybe haven't been heard so much yes i totally agree but for a long time those stories were told anonymously like you know we had stories like the Kerry baby case and you know Eileen Flynn and Lovett and so many well i don't go into all the history of irish women but a lot of stories broke on the radio and were anonymously told. And I think what's new is people coming out and telling them in public. Um, I wondered about you as a writer because you say you've always told stories. I love the one where you told at school that you were a mermaid and could breathe underwater. But you did say, I told story after story about my parents. And you say when you were a child, your father made you promise, when I grew up, I would not become a writer. I solemnly said the words, but inwardly I knew I, that I would do the opposite. So when did you start writing the stories down? So I, if you had asked me when I was a child or when I was a teenager or when I was in my early 20s what I wanted to, to be, you know, I would have said a writer. And then kind of real life takes over a little bit and you think, okay, well, I need to do something practical. And I became an academic and I love my job. And I, there's a lot of writing involved in my job. I, I mean, I write essays all the time. They just don't tend to get read by that many people. And I mark a lot of student essays and so on. And, and that becomes all absorbing. And then I realized in my late thirties, I kind of, one of those moments I was, when you get to your, that point in your life and you pause and you look around and you think, maybe this is not the life that I thought that I was going to have and asking myself, okay, well, what am I going to do about that? And that was the time when I started writing about my father. So my dad had the reason for me starting all of this was my dad had, was an alcoholic and had been all my life and had gone into liver failure in 2013. And he lives in Greece and so he went into intensive care and that sparked a whole kind of process of re-examining our relationship, mine and his, but then also my own relationship to alcoholism and how it had always been this thing in our family that was, that I hated, but I accepted at the same time and that we all knew, but nobody ever talked about. And that has been one of the things that I've heard from so many families that have addiction issues and people who love people with addiction um, or people who are addicts or who are former addicts, the way in which it's known, but never spoken about. And I had to get it out of my head. It was just going around and around in my head. And so writing was, began as a cathartic attempt to rid myself of really a lot of conflicting emotions. And one of the things I like about writing memoir and particularly essays, rather than a straightforward autobiography or, you know, this is who I was when I was born and this is who I am now, is I think that essays can be quite contradictory and you can, you can reflect on the process. And I was writing about my life at a point where I didn't really know what direction I was going in. And so, the outcome of that has been that I have become the kind of writer that I always wanted to be and that I had suppressed for a really long time. And it's amazing how we can do that, I think, to our dreams, that we can let them go quiet and they can be some of the things that we silence as well, because maybe we think dreams are things that you have when you're a teenager or in your 
in your early 20s and and then you you know you become you grow up and you 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 become more sensible and and actually if there's anything that has come out of notes to sell for me it is uh taking the risk to follow the dream and really really doing it of what's very powerful about your book is I mean you wrote in that one about your father I wonder to myself when it was I became his parent I mean you required from a very young age to take on this adult role that he tells a funny story about when you were four on the beach and you had to go foraging for your own food but quite shockingly you know you're 10 your mum is out at a party you said the phone rings it's your dad he says he's going to kill himself that night and you're right, you don't know what he's asking of you. You do know something is being asked. I mean, there's so many times that something over and above the requirements of being a child, you know, that no wonder you left some of your dreams behind because you were being pushed into an adult role when he was being quite childish, actually. Um, you know, when he's saying to you, I'm just bored of kids now, you know, and just, you know, he can say things like that and you have to step into the adult role. I thought that you, it was extraordinary how you show that, how you did take so much of um, the responsibility on. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling and, and nodding and almost laughing because there is a strange thing about writing a, it down, which is that, and it's funny, this was part of the conversation that I had when the book was being edited, which is that I had written down some of my childhood memories, like, for example, my dad never seeming to manage, because my parents split up when we were very young. And um, my dad would take us for, you know, a week in the summer and then maybe a week at Saturday afternoons. And he never seemed to get it together to be able to feed me and my sister. Like, it was just beyond his competence as a parent. And it's a fairly basic thing. And it became a funny story in my family. And we would tell it as, this was our way of talking about it without talking about it. So we would tell it as a kind of amusing anecdote. And when I wrote it down and I showed it to the editors in draft form, they said, this is great material, but there's a problem, Emily, because you were telling it as if it were a funny story, but this is not funny because what happened to you, you as a child and, and also what is happening to your dad, none of this is, is amusing. And I realized, and I had to go back and rewrite quite a lot of the book in minor ways in terms of the tone, because I had to treat my own life like it was a serious story and not a self-deprecating joke that you would just, you know, say, oh yeah, but that doesn't matter because, you know, it, that's hilarious and um, I always use this where I say oh a hilarious thing happened to me and my partner says I think we need to look up hilarious in the dictionary because it does not mean what you think it means <laughs> so it's a very Irish thing to do to turn well you know you talk about you teach Beckett that's what Beckett does he turns tragedy and drama into high comedy and farce but I mean I like do classic. like that it's Sorry. a classic thing right if you don't if you don't yeah laugh about it you'll cry so you laugh yeah yeah um, you make the own jokes before somebody else does it um one of the powerful things is that you um exposing the euphemisms around drinking especially around male writers i mean we all know the stories james joyce flan o'brien patrick Kavanagh, brendan bean it is a joke and they're kind of a hero of these narratives and you know it's not funny i mean i really like the way you tell the underside of that the fallout and you actually, I mean, you said your father calls you a bully, but you do ask him to confront the fact that people have been hurt by his behavior, that there is another side to that funny life and soul of the party story. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. It is. Um, thank you. Um, it was interesting because and another part of the book, and, and you'll know that it comes later, I write about how, because the book isn't, particularly chronological. I write about how as a teenager and then when I was in my 20s as well, I drank a lot and myself and had a kind of lot of self-destructive behavior in very kind of general terms. And I, it was only really in writing the book and realizing that I had to confront my, the, uh, the parts of my own life as well in which, which were serious and in which I had behaved in destructive ways towards myself or towards my family. And so I, I really do 
endorse that idea of writing about the self as a way of looking at yourself and then and then a, as a way of thinking about your relationship between the self and the world which, which seems very which sounds very solipsistic but really is a way of understanding how much bigger things like family and like emotions and like loyalty and reliance and resilience and dependence and unlike Beckett I don't think of dependency as a negative thing as a way actually of me realizing and trying on the page to talk about how we need each other we you know we we define ourselves in terms of our relationship to each other and it's one of the things I say about my dad but also about my own life which is that I can't stand his alcoholism for example I hate it but I love him and I won't walk away from that and I can't I find it very hard to look at certain things in my own life that I've done but I won't walk away from them I will own them and incorporate them in and integrate them in my sense of a bigger life and I think that's something I've really learned uh, from writing but also from reading other great writers who have have written about their lives I need to remind me so strongly reading your book of that feminist slogan, the personal is political. I mean, feminism is completely embedded in the text, but I mean, you've already covered this, that storytelling about your life connects to other women's lives, the great silences around, you know, bleeding about, um, you know, first of all, having periods and then stopping having them with menopause, about fertility, infertility, about stillbirth, about, um, you know, all these things we don't talk about. We don't talk about them publicly. It's like we whisper about them to each other, if at all. I know. And then when it happens to you and you realize, you realize the shape of the silence that, and that you are not alone in that silence. It feels like, it feels like the loneliest place ever. For example, after having a miscarriage, it just, I've never felt lonelier. And and, what, and there were so many mixed emotions. I mean, I can't believe it now, and it seems strange to say, but I actually, like I actually experienced shame for my body going through this. And for, and for, that was so much a part of not being able to talk about it. And then realizing that there were all these other women, almost in silhouette, and men, because it happens to men too, and um, all these other women in that silence with me, and none of us, could speak or touch each other as a result of this kind of blanket of shame. And, and so that it became a kind of a political thing really to, to talk about. Again, in the context of women in 2018, so bravely talking about their experiences of pregnancies that did not work out. And I had been affected by the anti-abortion legislation in Ireland and um, the way in which the end of the pregnancy was dealt with. Um, and, and just thinking, okay, there is solidarity here and it doesn't make up for loss, but knowing that you're not alone in that loss is, it does give you something. Yes. I mean, the silence where the midwives couldn't tell you that your pregnancy had ended because of the anti-abortion legislation. I mean, we just don't think about the other kind of ramifications of it because it was sold in such a, a one-dimensional way. I mean... <laughs> I used to be a primary teacher in Ireland long ago and people just took it for granted. They knew how I felt about it. And I was so angry about all that. But, you know, the silences that were put down on us because of the church. Um, you talk about your family being unusual. Most other families did not look like ours. And I love the bit about you seeing a sign in a travel agent's for a package holiday deal. One parent and two kids. It was the first time I had ever seen my family reflected publicly, one parent plus two children. And you say our family did not exist. And because we did not exist, we could not be protected. And, you know, as you say, you weren't the only family like that, but it would have felt like that for you. Well, so my parents split up in 1982, I suppose, around then. Um, and... The only reason that that's significant is because divorce was not legalized until the first divorce was legalized in 1997. There was an abortion, or sorry, an abortion, a referendum um, over divorce in 1995, and it took then over a year to ratify it. 
um, as law. And that, that referendum only just passed. And it's, it's, I think it's very difficult to explain to people from other countries that it was 1995 when that started to change. And the, the, the debate that happened at that time was, you know, about how um, Irish society would dissolve if marriage was allowed to be ended and so on. And yet I had grown up in a family where that had been our state, you know, our, our status for over a decade. And, and what I mean by we could not be protected is if you don't legislate for reality, just like women traveling um, to England and to Amsterdam and so on to, to gain, get terminations of pregnancy. If you don't legislate for reality, then, then it is happening anyway. And so the vulnerable people are the people who get punished and burdened with that. And we see that constantly. Um, the, you know, the, the people who are not minded, who are not protected, um, are, the, are the ones who are suffering um, from the inequality in legislation. Also, you bring your family into existence by writing about them. I don't know if you've read Jacqueline Wilson's book, The Illustrated Mom. I mean, it's for a teen 7 to 11 audience, but uh, I've been teaching children's literature. And in some ways, your story really reminded me of that, that you're telling the untold stories. You well, write a lot. I mean, it's, yeah. also, it's, not, it's not just restricted to Ireland. I mean, for years, we, live, we lived in London because my mum's job brought us there. And I remember it was the John Major government and um, Howard and John Major, all they ever talked about was how the, the problems with society were because of single parent families. So we existed in English politics, um, but as the, the demons of, of everything that was wrong with society. And I was, you know, me and my sister are sitting there kind of going, how, how can you say that about us? I, you know, we are, we are a family, we are trying just like everyone else. And this is what makes me so angry and so passionate about writing is the tiny narrow definition of who gets to be the story. And we have to get rid of that. There are so many stories. We have so many stories and not everybody is crazy and wants to, you know, write a memoir, which is fine. But I, I really think there's so much to be gained from people writing for themselves their own story or telling their story within their family or to someone who might listen because the other side of that is that if you know the personal is political then speaking becomes both personal and political but listening becomes personal and political too and i think of all of the people who i have listened to and and who have told me their stories following me speaking out and it's it, it becomes a reciprocal relationship that's so important. Um, you write about, you know, being proud of your scars. And I mean, I do have your book, The Politics of Irish Memory, your textbook, um, that you have a marvellous essay in there about memoir. But you say there that the risk of the memoirist is that it's opening old wounds. I strongly felt about this book you're not opening wounds, you're showing off the scars, that they're signs that you have been hurt, but you've healed. And I thought, that's what you're doing in the essays. This happened, but you're taking control of it now and you've healed. And here are the scars. I'm fine. You know that it's... I do. And I like that idea. And one of the reasons why I like it, and one of the things that I write about, and one of the scar I think that you're talking about is a scar from having a breast lump removed. And how actually, and I, I, I'm incapable of talking about this without pointing to the breast, um, but how I look at that part of my body and I think, I own you. I, I carry this scar and that scar is knowledge and it is taking control and agency and ownership of my body. And so I think that, you know, I don't want to open that wound at all um, and or, or and other psychological wounds either. But I think that idea that, that we go through life and we carry our scars with us and we carry, our, we, we don't recover from grief. We don't overcome trauma or leave it behind or whatever the, the language is. We learn to carry it. And part of the way we can learn to carry it is learning how to put it into a story. 
um, the story of our lives is the way that we can carry both joy and grief with us. You've got so many powerful metaphors in here. Like you say, sometimes it's hard to look in the mirror and you're talking about your actual mirror and your body. But a memoir is a kind of a way of looking in a mirror, isn't it? That you look at yourself and talk about what you see and it's a kind of a recognition and a telling. I thought that worked really well. The more I read the book, you know, every time I go back into it, and uh, I've been listening to the audio book as well because I love audio books. It's a really good reading. Um, I can imagine it's technically difficult, but how did it feel for you to actually speak those words when you're recording your audio book? So they asked me, did I want to record the book? And I, I had to do it because I couldn't imagine somebody else's voice talking about things that are so personal to me and um, though I know lots of people do do it but I hadn't really anticipated how sitting in a tiny studio um, being recorded would actually feel and it was I think the hardest thing that I did with the book um, because I wanted it to I wanted it to sound like me not to sound like an actor and so I had to when I was reading I, I was actually thinking and feeling all of the experiences again. And so it was very, very emotional. And there was, there was one point um, when we'd done three, try to take, do three takes on a particular I'll say, scene um, in a hospital, the, the scene is set in a hospital. And the sound engineer said, you know, I think we're going to go with the fact that you sound like you're crying because that will actually, the reader will get that it's emotionally important for you. And I was so grateful because <laughs> I thought, thank goodness. Um, but that means that I also at the other side of it, because I don't want people to, who haven't read the book to think that it is just a misery memoir. And um, it also meant that I got to re-experience that feeling of agency and joy as well. You know, the fact that the essay about my dad ends with he and I having this really great relationship now because we have cleared the air and he is healthy now and he's sober and we have this just honest relationship now and where I get to at the end of the book where I where I'm able to look at myself in the mirror of the book and say yes I see all the scars and all the bits you know that I don't particularly like but this is all of me and that is worth knowing and worth owning. So I, 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 there is a kind of, there is an emotional trajectory, I hope, to the book because important for people who are reading it, but also really important for me. You know, I had to really feel like this was not just a rehearsal of all the worst moments of my life, that this was, you know, a reflection of bigger things. And you do say that now that you're safe and you have a home and a partner and a job that you love, and it is a celebration that, you know, as you say, it's not just that you were survived all that, but that's part of who you are and part of how you got there. This is the path. Um, I wondered about, I mean, you say you still find ways to beat yourself up, don't we all? But I wonder if in some ways that the memoir I mean, you write about memoir in your book that um it's taken over from confession that it's a kind of forgiving of the self we're not asking for a priest or god or even other people if you're forgiving yourself i think in the stories you're saying i did the best i could and here i am and i thought that was extraordinary about i keep saying extraordinary but it is a wonderful book it's a wonderful book Thank you. And I think I think that is a really lovely way of thinking of it, of forgiving the self and and also gets us around that word, which is confession. Because I, I'm not confessing anything. I, I just reject that idea. And I, I know you weren't saying that, but that idea that, you know, we would have grown up in an Ireland that constructed our the things that we did with our lives as sins that we had to confess. And there, and that may be a particularly Catholic dog dogma but it's also a particularly patriarchal dogma around women and how we should be embarrassed or ashamed or have guilty pleasures i i just have pleasures there's nothing guilty about them i just you know i refuse to confess this is out there and like it or not yeah, I, i'm just going to have to finish because we've run out of time but, i mean you do say I knew that stories could never be enough. They can't transform the damp or the cold. But one thing, this book is so transformative. 
And you say, I did not realize that stories had to be true. I thought they only had to be interesting, which is so funny because that's the way kids are. But you have managed to make your story both true and interesting. And yes, there are funny bits as well. Thank you very much, Emily Pine. It's been an absolute pleasure. So now I'm going to hand over to Alison, who's going to interview uh, Christine Dwyer Hickey. And I'm going to disappear for a while. So thank you, everybody. I can find her. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Thank you. And so many themes in common, I think. So well done for our organizers this evening, for Deirdre and uh, Sandeep for, for putting these two authors together. It's amazing. So I'm going to introduce you to Christine Dwyer Hickey first, the very short little biog. So uh, Christine is a novelist, playwright, short story writer, whose work has been widely translated. She's published eight novels, a play, and award-winning short stories. Tatty, which will be our focus this evening, was first published by New Island Books in 2004, and it was shortlisted for Irish Novel of the Year 2005. And um, it was also listed as one of the 50 Irish novels of the decade at the Irish Book Awards 2010, and was nominated for the Orange Prize, now the Women's Prize for Fiction. It's now back in the news, as it is the 2020 Dublin One City One Book. So Christine's other novels include The Cold Eye of Heaven, which won the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year 2012, and Last Train from Liguria, which is set in Italy during Mussolini's fascist regime and was nominated for the pre-European de literature. Her latest novel, The Narrowland, published by Atlantic 2019, is set on Cape Cod in 1950 and examines the turbulent marriage of American artist Edward and Hopper. And Christine, I thought we might start with the Narrow Land because you've had some fantastic news lately, uh, some great successes. Um, just recently, you have won the Walter Scott Prize and the Dawkey Literary Award. So maybe you tell us about finding out about these two prizes in such quick succession and how that felt and how you reacted. Well, um, yeah, I, it was 15 months after publication and I had sort of just accepted the fact that the, the novel had been written and all that work had gone into it and it was just going to be one of those novels that's quietly forgotten. And, um, and then I got a phone call from my agent, no, not my agent, my publisher phoned me on a Monday to say that I'd won the Walter Scott. I nearly had a heart attack when I found out because I wasn't expecting them to go, I knew I was shortlisted for that and I wasn't expecting them to go ahead. I thought that they would put it on the long finger or added on to next year or something. So anyway, got the call for that, used a lot of bad language, which happens to sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm my, my publisher is very ladylike, so there's a bit of a silence. But anyway, pulled myself together and sort of cried and that. And I was just getting over that. And the next, the very next day, I thought I was having um, an interview, a Zoom interview. And that was probably my first Zoom experience. So I was sort of up to 90 about that. And I thought it was just an interview for the shortlisted people. Um, on the Dawkey Literary Award. And uh, in the middle of it, she told me I'd won, the, uh, won that as well. So that was two prizes in two days. And uh, I don't know, it was just overwhelming, I think. It was yeah. overwhelming. Yeah, amazing. And I mean, presumably yeah, that's amazing. incredibly important as well for something as practical as exposure and book sales and yeah. getting the message out a bit further. Yeah, it was. I mean, it is already. There's, there's a lot been going on and people asking to, you know, about making a film out of it. It'll probably never happen, but still, there's an awful lot of interest suddenly. And it actually feels like saying, listen, it's the same book it was six months ago. You know, where were you then? But anyway, um, I'm delighted. I am delighted. Really. Yeah, well, I would uh, like to read out what the, um, the Walter Scott Prize jury said, because it's a, okay. a lovely little uh, just thumbnail description. It's a risky business portraying the marriage of two artists, particularly when both the marriage and the art have already been picked over by biographers and art historians. Christine Dwyer Hickey has embraced the risk and created a masterpiece. In the narrow land, she reaches into the guts of the marriage of Joe and Edward Hopper and into the heart of the creative impulse itself and much, much more. <clears throat> so that should pique the interest, I think. So I know we're yeah. here to talk about Tatty mainly, but I thought you might like to give us, you know, a quick overview of what what brought you to the story of Edward Hopper and, and why you wanted to give him a voice and another opportunity to, to be heard? Well, it was sort of accidental. It started with a little boy, a little boy who was a German refugee just after the war, 
when Germany was full of displaced people and many of them were children. And uh, anyway, it kind of somebody told me a story about the, all the malnutrition that the children had suffered in post-war Germany and how they were sent off to little farms to be fattened up and then sent on to America to be adopted. And uh, it just, that just stuck in my head for a couple of years, this vision of a little boy sitting on a train. And um, then I went to Cape Cod. I was in Boston on a book tour and I went to Cape Cod and I knew the minute I got there that was going to be my location. And I've always loved the paintings of Edward Topper. He had a summer house in Cape Cod. Himself and his wife built this summer house and they, were there, they went there for 30 years where they would work and fight and eventually, you know, the summer would pass. And I, I sort of thought I'd give him a little cameo roll, you know, on the side of a, of a hill. But I didn't expect him to muscle in and take over the whole uh, book, which he did. He took over the whole book. But anyway, um, that was the starting point. And once, uh, and then I saw a documentary about uh, Edward Topper when I was recovering from an illness. Um, and uh, I was lying on the sofa feeling sorry for myself and I started to watch this documentary. Uh, and it was mostly in Cape Cod. And he, she was in it and he was in it and he was very, he was, he was six foot seven and she was five foot and they were opposite in every way. He rarely spoke and if he did, it was very slow and it took ages to say anything. Where she was, she tweet away. And uh, you could see there was some, there was friction there. And I think that I kind of began to enter their marriage then. And just one thing led to another. And eventually I had, I had the book, you know. Well, there's great potential for a movie. Yeah. I think I have, a, I have a copy here. And I mean, amazing artist, you know, beautiful yeah. looking book as well. And, uh, you know, just Thanks, continued yeah. success with that. Thank you so very much. We had to mention that, but we are here to talk about Tati <laughs> as well. Okay. And I know you're going to do a little reading for us in a minute. Okay. So, um, so Tati um, first published 15 years ago. So, as I said, back in oh, the yeah. limelight again, because yeah. it was chosen as Dublin with City One Book and reissued as well. Beautiful new cover as well for Tati. And, yeah. uh, you know, back in the news, it tells the story of a little girl growing up in the 1960s in Dublin. Yeah. And uh, we'd love to hear you do a reading in Tati. Okay. Be amazing. I'll read. It's um, when I was listening to Emily speak there, there were so many things in common. Uh, but I fictionalized this. And again, it was sort of an accidental thing. Um, and this piece I'm going to read now is uh, a piece about, which really, did, which really did happen quite often, a piece about the little girl, Tatty, going to the races with her dad. And this is a very typical thing of what would have happened to me um, when she's, it's, and this is 1965. She's nearly five and gets lost at the races. One minute she's standing behind dad under his long brown raincoat. The next minute she's lost. She's standing under his long brown raincoat and it's like as if she's inside her own little tent. She can hear everything that's going on outside but can only see what's inside the tent. The lining is shiny with bumps here and there from all the stuff that fell through his raincoat pockets. Pointy pen, roundy pillbox, a couple of coins that must have wiggled all the way down to the hem. The bigger thing stayed in his pockets. Newspaper, notebook, liver salt tin. And there's the big fat book full of horses' names that you always see him reading. She can see the bulge of his binoculars on the far side of the coat and can hear the little badges rattling off the strap every time he moves his arm. She can see the dark shape of him in his suit and can hear the people's feet running by in and out of the rain. Dad tells her that when he gives her the nudge, that means she has to grab a hold of his jacket because he's going to start running and she has to run out behind him. Like a circus horse, he says. Do you know what I mean? She doesn't, but likes the sound of it anyway and can't wait for Dad to get going. She pulls her hands out of her mittens so she can keep a good hold of his jacket, then dances her feet up and down so they're nearly ready to run the minute he gives her the nudge. But the rain is too bad, he says. The rain is long and icy. So he changes his mind and says he'll have to leave her behind. He pulls his coat away, lifts her up, and puts her down in a doorway near the men's smelly toilets. You stay here, he says, till I get back. Do you hear me now? You're not to budge, not an inch. He tugs her collar up around her ears, tells her to put her mittens back on, pulls her pixie cap down over her forehead, then leaves her. 
As soon as she stops seeing his long brown raincoat, she goes out after him. But there are too many big bodies in the way and too many brown coats and the cold rain keeps smacking her on the face. So she comes back in and follows the heat into the bar. When Dad comes back to the doorway, there's no sign of her anywhere. And then he's up the wall. He runs around everywhere, pulling his people's sleeves. Did you see? Did you see? A little girl, this size, copper colour hair, a fringe. He keeps going on about the fringe, even though you wouldn't be able to see it, because he's forgotten already about the pixie cap and that he's pulled it down over her forehead. The voice from the sky calls out her name. The voice from the sky tells everyone her business, her age, her size, where she lives and what she is wearing. Brown jacket, brown trousers, yellow jumper. Dad told the voice what to say. If it had been ma'am, the clothes would have been different. It would have been a biscuit coloured sheepskin coat, chocolate brown slacks, a mustard polo neck sweater, a cream coloured pixie cap. Because that's the way ma'am always talks about clothes, like you could eat them. <laughs> but ma'am doesn't go to the races. She stays at home with Deirdre and Jeannie and Brian and baby Luke because Jeannie might have an asthma attack and in any way she doesn't like to ask anyone to mind Deirdre on account of her always screeching. When dad finds her, she's behind the counter sitting on a beer crate. She has one rosy cheek from the big heater beside her and she's sucking a bottle of fizzy orange through a straw. She has one hand on top of the heater and her mitten is slapping from the string in the sleeve of her jacket. Dad starts shouting that it could have gone on fire. Then he starts shouting at the barman. Did you not hear her name being announced, you stupid fucker? Are you deaf? Ah, how could I? The noise in this place. And wasn't she grand in there? Not a bother on her. Wasn't she warm at least? You'd no business taking her like that. He didn't take me, she says. I went in myself. What did you do that for? Because the rain kept smacking me on the face and I don't like the men's smelly toilets. Then dad starts laughing his head off. He lifts her up on the, and sits her on the counter and all the men have to hear how he found her when she was lost. And she keeps on saying, I wasn't lost, I wasn't lost, I wasn't. But no one can hear her because the bar is stuffed with big men's voices bashing around. You better not tell your mother, dad says, or they'll be murdered, do you hear me now? You won't go, will get me into trouble. I won't. Is that a big fat promise? Yes, Daddy. Say it. It's a big fat promise. When he opens the front door, she runs under his arm and comes shouting into the house. Ma'am, ma'am, I wasn't lost. I wasn't. They said I was, but I wasn't lost. I wasn't. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, I was really struck by something Emily said about um, the question, who gets to be the story? And yeah. when is it your turn to tell the story? Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you that in the context of Dublin One City, One Book. So yeah. This is a huge reading initiative been going on in Dublin since 2006. And yeah. the idea being everyone to read the same book based on the city. But when you've had Gulliver's Travels and Dracula and the picture of Dorian Gray and then yeah. the 20th century, that Joyce and Edna O'Brien, where do you see Tatty fitting into that panoply? You know, where does her story fit into Dublin? Well, I suppose if you've had a ghost and you've had, a, you know, you've had all those people, why not the, the voice of a child? Yeah. Um, I think it is the story of many things. An alcoholic family happens to be one of them. And um, in this case, both parents are, are addicts and the father has the dual addiction of gambling. And I think that's a very common thing. And again, as Emily said, uh, it's something we don't speak about or it's rarely spoken about. And you find, even as an adult, I find when I talk about it, I get this sort of wobble in my stomach as if I'm an informer, as if I'm letting somebody down. And as if when I'm finished speaking to you, someone is going to pull me outside and take me into a corner and slap the legs off me and say, I told you to keep your mouth shut, you know? So there is that fear all the time. I hope T Tatty, because she's a very Dublin, little Dublin girl, and because she loves her city and she loves people and she's funny as well as being sort of slightly tragic. Um, I hope that she fits in. She fits in well. And I'm sure if we, if we um, dug deep into the other stories, that there will be things in common. Hmm. 
Yeah. And um, so I believe you began writing Tatty's story as a therapeutic exercise. Yeah. Right it at was. the beginning w without necessarily yeah. thinking of publication. So how did that happen? Yeah. Happen? It's my fourth book. And I think the other three were the Dublin trilogy. And they were the story of a family. And I think that was, it was kind of my father's family. And I think it was in an effort to try and understand that very complex but talented family, I'd have to say, but very self destructive in other ways. And um, then I came to, I was thinking about my fourth novel, but my father had died in 1995 and I was having difficulty coming to terms with him. I mean, he had a lot of problems, but like Emily, I loved him very much. And uh, I was, I just, I was finding it difficult to cope and I ended up going to therapy, which is not something I would have ever thought of before, but it got so bad, that's what I decided to do. And in the course of the therapy, the therapist said to me, would you write down your experiences through the eyes of a child? She said, you're a writer, so I presume, you know, you, you could do that and do it through the eyes of a child. And that way you may be able to begin to understand that children are not responsible for their parents' problems or their parents' mistakes. So I did it and um, I wrote a little bit and then I wrote a little bit, another little bit. And then maybe a couple of chapters in, the little ping went off in my head and said, God, this is not bad now. This could be a quite a good novel. And, um, you know, I read some to my daughter and her pal and their tongues were hanging out listening to me. So I thought, well, I have the child's voice anyway. They weren't bored listening to me. And I looked on it as a challenge, not just to tell my own story, but also to, to look at it. After all, it is a novel, the changing voice. So her voice changes every chapter. Like she was nearly five in that piece. But each time her perception develops a little bit more, her voice changes. And that, I looked on that as the challenge. And, um, and then it was just too late to come back. Just kept going. Yeah, I, I must say you've done an amazing job with her voice because it's it's not something that's always successful. I think with writers using a child's yeah. voice. I, I mean, is the answer to that the fact that you went back almost yourself, or how do you account for the success of, of that voice? You know, but being so convincing and yeah. so unique. Um, well, I I do I, I I always come from the point of view of the character, no matter who the character is or what age. And so I just try to stick my head back into my own memory. And um, also I would look at children that age, you know, whatever age she happened to be when I was writing about them. If she didn't fit in with my own children's age, I would maybe be in a supermarket and I'd see someone that, and I'd say to the woman, how old is that? How old is your little girl? And she'd tell me, and I watch the child, you know? So I would crouch down and, and try to be the height of a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old. I'd try to remember the things that I noticed and the things see the thing, listen to the children, listen to children. And I just became her again. And I kind of dug back into my own past on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got to, you're, you're so close to it. You have to find a little bit of distance too. Mm. change some of the things in the book. It's nearly all true, except I have no sisters. Mm. So I gave Tatty a sister because when I read it from a novelistic point of view, it was too much burden to put on one child. So I gave her Jeannie, who is this smarter sister who can kind of, um, you know, analyze things sometimes a little bit better than she can. And then I also changed the special needs child. I have a brother with special needs and I changed that to a girl too. So that kind of gave me a little bit of distance. I know that sounds mm -hmm. foolish, but it just didn't seem quite so, I didn't, I wasn't quite so caught up in it in that, in that case, you know? Yeah. It's interesting you say that it was too much burden for one child in, yeah. in, in a fictional world. Yeah. In a real world, you know, in there's a real no world there. Yeah. yeah. And I know that's really important to you to, to talk about that theme. And well, it is. On, on children. Since, um, since lockdown and, and um, a couple of new things have happened, apart from the fact that when you got contacted with me to tell me Tati was going to be one city, one book, and I was so thrilled, but there was a sinking of the heart to think, oh God, I'm going to have to talk about this again. And I, when it came out first in 2004, I got a huge amount of um, letters from people, people who are saying to me, this is my story. And this is, and people from all different age groups and all different backgrounds. But anyway, during um, COVID, uh, I, I was doing a paper about James Joyce, John Joyce, J James Joyce's father. And I was so angry about the childhood that the Joyce's had because of this man. It was a chronic alcoholic, but he, he, he didn't try in any way to 
to even think about feeding the children or looking after the children or doing anything. It was all just about himself and his drink. And I found myself getting very angry about it. And coincidentally, a group called Silent Voices, which is a very good name, contacted me and asked me if I would sit in on a Zoom meeting with them to talk about Tatty. And they're, they're sort of professionals that deal with children of alcoholics, adult children of al alcoholics, and also ch children now. And when I spoke to them, I realized that nothing has changed. In fact, it's probably got worse in many ways. Um, but they're doing great work. Like they, they're, they're trying now to organize teachers to be trained to spot when a child comes from that particular um, background. Like when my parents split up and we were, you know, that was in the 70s and it was very late 70s, early 80s. And it was very unusual to be, um, to be from a, 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 a split family. And there was one little prefab at the back of the four courts that had one social worker in it. And I remember going in and saying, yeah, and he was saying, oh, tell me about your father. And I said, no, because we stayed with my mother, you know, or my father, rather. We st my mother left and we stayed with my father. And I said, well, my mother's an alcoholic too. And he, he just didn't want to know. He was like, as if I was making it up. You know, it didn't happen with women. So it was very difficult to get. So anyway, all these thoughts came up in my head around the same time. So I do want to talk about it, even though it is painful to, to talk about it sometimes. Still, it's ridiculous after all this time, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and yet there's so much humor in this book as well. Isn't well, because again, I, I think yeah. of what Emily said again. Exactly. About yeah. The idea of a story being hilarious, or you yeah. imagining it's hilarious without delving any deeper into yeah. it. Yeah. You always make it into I a mean, funny story to, because it's easy yeah. for people. If you're funny, I think. And when I was a kid, I would do the same thing as Emily did: tell the lies, like Tatty, like they're just because it was easier. If you told a lie, you were let the truth was less. Uh, discoverable. Yeah. It took something outrageous. And she, I, I have that in the book when she's got her father brings her to all the pubs and the pub man's wife gives her a dinner and they're always some of them ask nosy questions that she learns to tell outrageous lies and then they laugh and they don't they don't ask any anything else, you know? So yeah. they do that and the, the different roles is very interesting too that the the they're very predictable, but each member of the family would take on a different role and you know caretaker or enabler or scapegoat or lost child or all these different things and it still goes on you know mm -hmm. it goes on. all of that responsibility spread and huge you know, this attempt yeah. to hold it all together you know and, and make yeah. it look, you know yeah all right from the outside yeah um, exactly exactly mm -hmm. um so it is it's a very you know it's a very common thing and sometimes when I meet someone, it's like if, as if there's a little light gone over their head. I sort of know that's someone, that's my tribe, that's someone from, they don't have to say anything. You just kind of see something in people sometimes, you know, and you, you understand what the situation is. Yeah, you get each other. We're going yeah. to take some audience questions, I think, in a minute. But I just wanted to ask you about Tatty now, because I know the way you talk about her and the way we feel about her when we've read the book, she's real. And uh, yeah. have you ever imagined catching up with her? or? later in life or what would she be doing or would you are you happy to leave her in the 1960s i left her in the 1970s mm -hmm. um i think um and i did there was a lot of you know talk and people asked me would i would i write the the next part of it but i couldn't because i think for me the most painful years were from 14 to 17 or 18 and i just don't want to go back there i just don't want to and i think as well again from the writer's point of view that it ends well because she doesn't know what's going to happen, but there's a, 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 something inevitable about it for the reader, but yeah. she's not sure what's going to happen. And we leave yeah. the, the image of the lost little lost family, the siblings. Um, where is she now? Well, she's probably sitting here talking to you, Alison. I'd say. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so we worked out. Yeah. Yeah. To I have exactly. to say uh, the ending really worked for me as well because, yeah. you know, and it's interesting because I found talking to people, sometimes older people have found the book too sad and maybe yeah. younger people are maybe with with the the hope of youth they're seeing her resilience and for me that's yeah. the word she is a, such a resilient kid yeah she you is know yeah. she'll be good and and it'll it'll be great yeah. in spite of it all so yeah you know, it, it yeah. is a great ending so yeah, uh, we'd course. love to continue but we'll no, no, take no questions from our lovely audience we can only okay. imagine you out there <laughs> so uh, now we have a, a question here from somebody who wants to remain anonymous, but a uh, question for Emily, I think it, 
it's, it's related to you as well, Christine, but for Emily, did you worry about how your family would react to the book and the stories being out in public? Yes, is the really short answer. Um, so I, my family, and this is, again, relates to Christine because of the element of fictionalization, right? And one of the things that was put to me was that I could write it under a pseudonym, you know, and I really didn't want to because for me, large part of the point was that it is true and that I was claiming it for nonfiction as, as real. Um, but I showed the book came out in 2018 and my family read it in 2017 in draft form when I had a first draft complete. And that was really important so that they felt that they were involved in the story in some way as well and had some kind of purchase on it. I mean, obviously they're involved in the story, um, but uh, because I talk about them, not they are my material. Um, my mum is from a generation that did not talk about things in public. In fact, when something went wrong in the family, you closed the ranks of the family and you kept that secret safe inside. And so she said to me, I totally understand why you would want to write this book, Emily, but uh, I have no idea why you would want to publish it. And so she probably out of all of my um, family had the hardest time um, coming to terms with it. And then it wasn't really until after it was published and people started talking to her and saying, you had such a hard time as a mother with two small kids and, you know, an ex-alcoholic husband and um, telling her their stories or talking about their, do their own children and what their children had gone through, that I think she saw that it linked up for her what the, what the purpose of publishing mm. like this is. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I ask their forgiveness every day and um, <laughs> There's a moment when my mum said, the next person who asks me, am I Emily Pine's mother? I'm just going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> but she hasn't done it yet. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Uh, now for Christine, we have uh, Rose Cullen, quite a technical question here. Um, Rose is currently reading The Narrow Land and hugely enjoying. She's wondering why you chose to have alternating points of view and what informed the choice of those points of view. Well, I, there's many characters in it, but I've actually only got three points of view in it. Um, Michael is a refugee boy, Edward Hopper and Joe Hopper. And again, it's because I suppose when I started to think about being a writer, there were two writers that influenced me the most were Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. And I like the way uh, Leopold Blue came, Bloom came first. But say, we say Leopold Bloom and Mrs. Dalloway in the case of Virginia Woolf. And I love the way you were inside their head and you could just see what they saw, hear what they heard. And it meant that it gives it a kind of, it grounds it, no matter how outlandish things might get, it still grounds it. And that's the way I've always wanted to write. So you couldn't go into everybody's head. And if you went into nobody's head, then you're, you're floating above it. But, are, you know, I, it just felt right for me to get into the boys and Joes and, and they see all the other characters and it goes around. Mm -hmm. It's just the way I write. Yeah. I always have to be in at least one person's head. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, and, and also with um, Tatty, I know you went from uh, second person singular to third person. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is really interesting, it, but you didn't particularly notice it until examining it later. But Yeah, I, that, that was that kind of the Dublin you, you go down the road, you do yeah. that. Well, that was her, and maybe me as well, a little bit, um, watching herself which it would be a, a typical thing a child like that would do. They're watching themselves rather than being themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, here's a, quite a big question for both of you, if you want to answer first, Emily. Um, do you see yourselves as cultural ambassadors for Ireland? And do you feel responsibility for that? Um, no, yes. <laughs> question. On a good day, yes, if I can do any good. Um, you know, it's funny, the, the, the other way of answering that is that I was asked, did I think the, that Notes to Self was a particularly Irish book? And in lots of ways I do, because obviously things like there being no divorce and, and so on um, is a very, very specifically Irish um, historical situation. Um, but in lots of ways, it's actually the universality of it. And you know, that, that I think connects with people. And so when it was, you know, being kind of sold and published in America and different countries, um, I remember thinking, I just don't understand. I just don't understand why they would, why they would find this interesting. And I, I think it is that idea of that no matter where you live, the, these things happen and these kind of 
kind of silences appear. I'm, I mean, when it was published in France, I thought everyone there was so sexually liberated that they didn't need to, you know, talk about silence. But actually, this it turns out still relevant. Um, so I, I think I think books travel and in really interesting ways, and they go to unexpected places, and that's really exciting. And I think rather than me representing it, I feel like the book has brought me in its wake and I've been going to these other places as well. I mean, to be doing a kind of event like this with the word UNESCO in the title is, is an honour that I, I never thought that I would get to have. So it's a huge privilege. Thanks, Emily. And Christine? I kind of agree. Yeah, you know, well, I don't know where's my Ferrari Roche. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, I would try to say, you know, it's it, when you when you go somewhere on a tour or something like that, you are aware of the fact that you're, and you get a little bit proud because we do have a very good reputation for writers, um, and for books, and people just associate Dublin with with both of those things, and you're aware of that, so you're a little bit proud of it. The book travels. On its, I agree with what Emily said there, the book goes ahead of you. And if the book is well received and, and it goes to funny places, like Tati in particular has gone to straight, like it's translated into Arabic, which I thought was really funny, a funny language to pick it, a funny place um, for it to go. But I'm delighted with that. But, um, you know, in Estonia and different places like that, and I love going to them. Uh, I don't know if I would consider myself to be an ambassador, but I try, I suppose, in my own way, not to make too much of a show of myself in my country. <laughs> <laughs> Possible. So we have a few different people uh, wanting your, both your recommendations. So people asking about essay collections and uh, what you would recommend as uplifting or absorbing reads for summer lockdown. So anything um, springing to mind there. Do you want to answer that one first, Christine? Yeah, I'll just say, well, my daughter is looking in tonight, and not for me, I have to say, but for Emily. She said it's the best book of essays she's ever read in her life, and she's a big reader, you know. So, I, and I read Emily's, and I love them too. You don't have to say anything about my books, don't worry, Emily. I don't you want to. Um, <laughs> but I would think a big, just to finish up mine, a big lockdown book that I would, I've just finished, and I loved, is that Paragon by Colin McCann. It's a very panoramic, it's a very big book, um, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful book, and I would recommend that. I, I, know, I know we don't have the time to explain what it's about, but take my word for it. It's something that will keep you completely occupied for quite some time, and you will close it now and then have to think about what you read and how you felt about it and open it again and do it again. It's just a wonderful book. So that's my main one. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, there are so many, it, there are so many great words. I have, to, I get asked this question and my brain instantly fills with all of these different choices and I panic. And just to think of a couple that have struck me, um, obviously, at the moment, lots of people are talking about highlighting um, kind of black writers and ways in which we can maybe share the microphone and uh, devote more attention. One of the books um, in the last few years that have really struck me has been This Hostile Life by Malato Akori. And that's published now um, originally in Ireland by Skein Press and now has a Virago edition. Um, and I, that's a collection of short stories. And one of them is set um, in direct provision, which is the kind of refugee asylum um, provision service in Ireland and kind of exposes the inequalities and the vulnerabilities of that. And it's a, an extraordinary way for me as a as a reader to just get and this is the point you were talking about christine with like points of view to just get into someone mm. else's head and to go through an experience with that character mm. i would never have access to um, yeah so yeah this hostile life i really really recommend um as a you know a kind of as a minority writer who who should be more read basically yeah yeah okay i'm writing that down this well, yeah, interesting. You both picked choices that are outward looking, really, and, you know, seeking to know more about the world. I'd say we're probably out of time, but a very, very quick one for you, Emily. Any plans to write any fiction? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if fiction is easier or harder. I don't know. Christine, you could probably give me a master. <laughs> <laughs> easier. You can tell lies in fiction. You're not allowed to tell lies. <laughs> I know it's true, but then the, the other part of that is like I had the plot already, right? The idea. Of the yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Thank you both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both very much. Thank fun. you. Thank you. 
And now I'm handing back to Deirdre, I think, or Sandy. I think Deirdre is coming back with us. Yes, I've just figured out how to unmute myself and I'm looking for my video. Um, uh, I want to come back. Um, I'll start my video. Okay, right. Great. <laughs> right. Hello. Thank you, everybody. That was wonderful. Um, thanks to both Emily and to Christine for really interesting accounts of your writing and to Alison, of course, for the interview. So I'm, I have to encourage you to order the books from Five Leaves Bookshop and take up their three for two offer. And to apologise to Emily because I forgot to ask you to read an extract. So as I've just put in the comments, you're all going to have to buy the book now because it is fantastic. And I loved Tatty as well. I was very interested in the connections between those two, the, the drinking. So Sandy, your closing words? Yes, well, I wanted to say thank you to all of you, Alison, Christine, Deirdre and Emily for a fascinating and um, emotional and enjoyable uh, discussion. Um, I'm reflecting on writing as a therapeutic uh, activity and as a way of getting rid of conflicting emotions uh, and on Christine's oh, magnificent voice. Um, and in Emily's words, take the risk and follow the dream, uh, uh, which is really, really powerful. So thank you, all of you. Um, and I urge you all to uh, seek out Emily's essays and Christine's novels. Uh, we received a lot of positive feedback uh, from our first virtual author event last week, and we've made some changes to tonight, but we'd welcome more of your thoughts and feedback on tonight's event. Uh, the link to the form is now in the chat room. Uh, it will just take a few minutes of your time. And we'd really appreciate that. And I'm just going to finish now with a few thank yous of my own to Arts Council England for their funding, to Albert uh, Roberts, thank you so much for the sign language interpretation uh, today, uh, to Pippa, Deirdre and Ross at Five Leaves Bookshop for your support and organisation. It really means a lot, this collaboration, and with Alison at Dublin, UNESCO City of Literature too. And to all of you at home for coming along today and for sharing your comments and questions. It's been so much fun. And uh, we're taking a break next week, but we'll be back on Thursday, the 16th of, Ju of July with Philippe Sands QC and Stefan Collishaw in conversation with Keith Khan Harris. It's not to be missed. Uh, so save the date and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care everyone and goodbye. <laughs>